Time keeps on leaving and we keep on moving. When do we pass on our wisdom to the youth? My veteran story, lost ours discussions, fireside chats with the bourbon or two. It's time to hear the story by military veterans. Get yourself ready. It's the Lost Arts Podcast. The Lost Arts with Andrew Cox. Hello, hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Lost Art Podcast. That podcast is given a voice to our veterans. On today's episode, we will be having a My Veteran Story with Navy veteran Brandon Narr. But before we get into that episode, are you enjoying the podcast and consider becoming a TLA patron? That's the Lost Arts patron. It is through donations that we're able to continue recording the podcast and getting our veteran voices out for all to hear. Just go to the Lost Art website and click on the Become a Patron link at the top. If becoming a TLA patron doesn't work for you and you would rather give a one-time donation, then go to the Lost Art website and scroll down until you see the donations link. Any donation is appreciated. And if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, then email me at the Lost Art with Andrew Cox at gmail.com. That's the Lost Art with Andrew Cox at gmail.com. And as always, we do have merchandise for sale. We got cups, we got shirts, we got hats, we got all kinds of goodies. Just go to the website, click on that link, and you'll be able to find some of our goodies and, and has our stuff on it. And you can spread the love. Uh, all right. With that, I have Brandon here. Brandon, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. Awesome. Well, hey, I'm, I'm excited to have you here uh, uh, from our same hometown, Vianne. Uh, area and uh, we did some stomping. Uh, well, not at the same time, but same ground, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but let's let's kind of start at the beginning for you. Uh, like, wh- tell us about growing up and and then going leading up to the Navy. Uh, well, I grew up in a really small town, same town as you, um, in eastern Oklahoma, the foothills of the Ozarks, Vian, Oklahoma, infamous, uh, at least in my mind. Um, it was a, it was an awesome place to grow up during those times. Um, you know, there wasn't a ton to get into, but trouble. Uh, so you need to busy yourself with an activity of some sort, you know, right. play sports and whatnot. And, um, you know, I, I, I signed up for the Navy at 17, had to have my mom, uh, sign up, you know, cause you can't do that until the end 17 and a half i believe is yeah. the earliest you can sign up and i signed up at 17 and a half and uh, my grandpa was in world war ii as in uh, in the navy my dad oh. was a cb in the navy he did three tours in nam wow um, i believe we've had a every, somebody in my family you know all the way back to the civil war every every generation had been in combat um now after me i believe that died off but uh i was the last in the chain of you know someone being in the military and uh, experiencing uh combat so uh wow. it was something that i just felt like i needed to to do i didn't really have a lot of options i i felt <clears throat> you know so you know nobody really talked to me about college it was you know, man, you know, our generation, the, the Gen X generation, you, they just kind of like that, eh, you know, go outside, you know, yeah. whatever. Uh, That's right. You know, just <laughs> good luck. Um, but, you know, I never felt restricted, but not encouraged, you know, to go to college. And uh, quite frankly, I needed to go to the military. Uh, I knew that I was going to get in trouble if I did not join the military, uh, I enjoyed myself a little bit too much sometimes, uh, when I weren't, when I was not playing sports and I knew that kind of activity, uh, would probably end me up in prison at some time if I kept doing ignorant stuff. So uh, I joined the military and I found out in boot camp that some of those guys were there by court order. Um, you know, it was join the military <laughs> or go to jail. So I was like, huh, glad I wasn't doing that. So I uh, joined the military and, um, you know, that's, that's how it started. Yeah. And what year was that that you joined up? 
1988. 88, I went okay. in at the in August of 88. At the end of my summer, I enjoyed my summer. Um, you know, doing absolutely nothing. Uh, but getting to tan and working out, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh went in and uh, you know, I wanted to be a corpsman. That was my main goal. I I wanted to serve with the Marines. Uh and but I wanted to do something medical, and that's the only way you can do that is you, you know, uh is to be that. So Yeah, very true. Wow. So, uh, okay. So you joined, uh, 88, uh, right. and then it was off to boot camp for you up at, where, where did you go to boot camp? Great Lakes. Uh, Great Lakes up okay. in, up in, uh, Illinois, you know, near mm -hmm. Chicago. Uh, we call it great mistakes. Um, <laughs> you know, that was the old joke. Uh, man, we were, uh, you know, military boot, uh, Navy boot camp, not military Navy boot camp was not physically tough at all. It, it just wasn't. It was mentally, it was all mental games. And they did a very good job at that. Um, our uniform inspections uh, during boot camp and even my next, you know, my school um, was just as intense as any uniform inspection I had when serving with the Marines. So they did a good job at putting that pressure, you know. Uh, so... I commend them for that. Um, they, you know, you got to do like swim qual and normal stuff like that. And right before that, and of course, you know, if you knew how to swim, it's not a problem. But they had a, a big uh, whiteboard or something like that up. And it said, Navy one recruits zero. It's kind of odd, you know, and uh, one of the recruits drowned. Whoa. <laughs> And, and so they said Navy one recruits zero. And that was their end. That was, that was how they started the uh, lecture for swim call. And I was wow. like, oh, wow, this is brutal. You know, <laughs> attitude wise. Uh, it was it's not funny because the guy drowned, but I was like, you know, you had to laugh a little bit. Cause you're like, Jesus, these guys are, you know, uh, yeah. something else. Um, <laughs> You know, during boot camp, there was a, a few incidents that I, that kind of stood out. Um, we were in the barracks that were the old original barracks during uh, that they had during World War II. Uh, and they had the old M1 uh, rifles there, and they had filled the barrels full of lead. And that's what we drilled with. In Very camp. nice. Um, and, uh, you know, you had to stand watch outside of... I know that in the Marine Corps, they call them drill instructors, but mm -hmm. in the Navy, we call them company commanders or CC. Mm -hmm. So you had to stand outside, you know, pray rest, you know, right outside his door. And our CC had left for the day and some CC had was making rounds. He'd from that little 12th division part that we had, been, that we were staying in. And he kind of walked in there and he grabbed his rifle from behind and he said oh shit you know I, <laughs> look what i have and of course the recruits just looking at him like oh my god and he great you know the cc has it he just butt strokes him in the chest and we're all just like okay so he makes him try to take it back it didn't work too well for him and then he dog walked him with his uh, dog tags around the, uh, oh, the, the birdie. Yeah. On the floor, walking on all fours, hands and knees, barking and made him hike his leg <laughs> and act like he is peeing on stuff as a punishment, walking on his hands and knees. It was goofy. It was just surreal, you know, weird stuff. Uh, you know, the punishments were strange. Um, if you got in a lot of trouble, they would, uh, take the whole group of us and make you put on every bit of gear you had, turn on the showers oh, and no. go do PT inside <laughs> with the steam on. And they said, we're going to Vietnam. <laughs> that was the, <their, laughs> 
all of that was illegal, I'm sure. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, just goofy stuff like that. But it, uh, it wasn't horrible. Uh, I would say the hardest part, truthfully, was service week when we had to man different stations on the Naval Training Center, and they put me in the the chow hall. And uh, those hours the chow hall guys put in, those cooks, man, woo, dude, those guys work long hours. It was like 16-hour days. Yeah. You know, uh, I was, silly as that sounds, that was tough. You know what I mean? It, it, it just because you were awake so much, you know, for mm. the, for that time, you know, getting in, getting about three hours of sleep by the time you'd squared yourself away. So, uh, you know, graduated family came up, uh, for boot camp graduation, my mom and my little brother. And, uh, I had a girlfriend at the time she came up and, um, our company commander had told us all to get rooms at this one hotel. I'm sure he was getting a cut or something like that. You know, he wouldn't yeah, have told us probably. that for, for, you know what I mean? There's no reason for that. Uh, and there was a bar in there. And of course we're all under 21, but we're all down there drinking and um, stupidly enough. Uh, he was our, main company commander was like two you know there's like the head guy and the junior guy and he the the head guy was the he was the bad cop you know there's always good cop bad cops you know that one that will kind of break it down and maybe kind of help you and the other guy just blast you all the time mm -hmm. so the head one our main company commander he was in there and man he was drunk drunk and um he said some derogatory stuff to my girlfriend oh yeah. And um, so I make a go at him. Me and him about get into a fight, actual physical fight. They break us up. I'm a little bit drunk too, not thinking properly. And all that gets settled down. We got to go back to boot camp because for a week of processing. Oh, yeah. I think that I'm going to die. I mean, I should have just not said anything or even acted like I was going to lunge at him. He didn't say a word about it. He didn't even say nothing to me the whole time. I got so lucky. He, my life was in his hands. You know yeah. what I mean? At that point, I, 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 it was the dumbest thing to start my career in the military to wow. do. Um, but um, luckily he, probably saw the error of both of our ways and uh, let it slide. Thank God. I would have, uh, I'd like to see him out in the fleet. I'd have been nice to him, you know, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, cause it, it, no hard feelings after, after that, but it was just, it was so strange. Um, so it, bizarre, different times, you know, Yeah. Uh, in those days, it was, well, that, I, I could I could tell you from from then to now, uh, and things that happen in the military is completely different. Like fighting and, and those types of things, you hardly ever hear about it. Uh, I'm sure it oh, does wow. happen, but but yeah, it's not like it used to be, where you just kind of went out to the back and kind of settled your, your differences, if you will. Uh, but yeah, nowadays they don't do any of that stuff. They're not supposed yeah. to. Yeah, and he was old school. You know, what I mean, he was he was a. Uh... E7 at that time and 88. So he'd been in quite a few years, you know what I mean? So he, he had gotten taught by the old school guys, you know, uh, when yeah. he, he came up with them, he was a bosun's made a deckhand. Oh. So he was, you know, you know, an old Navy deckhand, man, those guys are. Yeah. You know, I can the, see that. Uh, uh, bosun's mates. Those are those guys that you don't mess with, you know? No, he was stout, dude. He was big. You know, he, if he had hit me, I'd have been, I was 18. He'd have late, he'd have hurt me because I wasn't yeah. that big of a guy at that time. And, um, I, I'm sure his grip strength was off the scale, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, so yeah, he was one of those guys. So went, finished that up, uh, went to basic hospital core school. Uh, basically right across the street 
Uh, oh, really? Yeah, it's right across the street there. And um, it, it's considered a, uh, I think, an A school is mm -hmm. what they call it. And um, all Navy corpsmen have to go through it. Um, it's, you know, five days a week, eight hours a day, a lecture. Oof. You know, unlike college, you know, where you go one hour, three times a week, you know, so you get three hours, we're getting eight hours a day, five days a week. And that's where I really learned how to study. Yeah. You know, it. I, I buckled down. I didn't go out, didn't go mess around, studied all the time. Um, it was really cold. It was uh, during the winter months in Chicago and our barracks were about a couple hundred, few hundred meters off of Lake Michigan that was froze over. Oh my God. And um, sometimes the uniform of the day was uh, you was allowed to wrap towels around your face, anything. Uh, Cause just walking to and from buildings, uh, guys were getting uh, frostbite on their ears. Um, and, and, you know that Chicago wind, uh, yeah. plus that, uh, you know, you could see your breath sometimes in the room, uh, even though the heat was on. I mean, you know, they're old man. You know, those yeah. buildings were <laughs> archaic, uh, cinder block type stuff. Uh, it, it was, it was it, that was you know the studying and. And in the cold, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't go out in town much. They didn't let you wear your civilian clothes uh, okay. out in town for about 50% of the time you were there. You had to earn wow. your civilian clothes. Uh, and if you're caught out in them, it, it, it was big trouble. Mm -hmm. wow. So uh, you had to wear your uniform on and off base if you're you know checking into the quarter deck you better be in uniform uh and they made sure that you had the if you did or did not have the little civilian clothes sticker on your id yeah, yeah, yeah. you know um so i don't know if they still do that kind of stuff or not yeah uh, I, I, maybe i know that uh at a schoolhouse for us we we would have them uh or they still stayed in uniform until uh, like they get through receiving and stuff like that, uh, usually about a week, week and a half. Uh, and then they're allowed to, okay, you can jump in civvies and go do things and stuff. But it just ours, depends on the threat. Yeah, ours is about a month or so. Yeah. You know, a good month, you know, something like that, that you couldn't wear. It kept you in that mode, you know. Yeah. You know, Which kept, pretty good. I, I, you know, uh, First time I went to a uh, theater on base, uh, they played the, you know, the national anthem before the movie started and everybody stood at attention. And I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> you know, it, you know, it, it was interesting. It's kind of cool. You know, it was a cool experience. I, uh, the first time I went to a movie on, on base, I was out in 29 Palms and me and the wife, we went to watch, uh, Oh man, I cannot remember the name of the movie, but uh, it was a Marine movie and they, uh, um, they're up at, uh, at an embassy and he tells them to open up, you know, on the, the crowd that was out there. And at that point, the entire uh, place, it was packed, completely packed. It, they all erupted. Of course, it was all grunts and they're like, yeah. And uh, me and my wife were like, okay, well, this is new. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a culture shock. It, 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 even though you've been in for just a little bit, everything is a new culture shock. You know, when you're in, you know, when you're still, you know, green as grass. You know. Yeah. <laughs> um, wow. So um, how, how did you find uh, your schooling? Was it was it tough for you, uh, or what? Well, like, because I imagine that, you know you're doing a lot of medical stuff, so it would be kind of tough. Yeah, I, I I thought that, you know, for the time given, they packed an incredible amount of information in. Um, it was, like I said, eight hours of lecture a day. So, and then you had to, you know, go back to your barracks and do whatever duties you had to do. But I studied every day, you know, every day. We might take like Saturday off. 
you know, but Sunday you better be learned up, you know, cause stuff's coming, you know, reviewing stuff. Um, I saved all my, uh, all my training manuals from it. I found them oh, nice. a few years ago. It was kind of, it was kind of cool. You know, some of it was like, oh, that's super easy, you know, but then I look at some, I was like, wow, they really got into that, you know? Um, yeah. So, you know, you got to be prepared to go into any part of the blue side of the Navy, you know, the blue side of medicine. Um, because to go with the Marines, you have to go to another uh, school. You have to go to field medical service school. Right. Um, but they got us ready to go into general medicine. You know, you could do all the necessary things pretty much. And then, of course, then you learn on the job. You know, then you get to your job, then you realize, wow, I only know a hair of what I should know. Yeah. You know, um, so that it, it was intense. It, I, I must say it was intense. And I think that kind of set the tone for the rest of my civilian life, even when I got out of how to buckle down and, and get after it and study. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so I, after that, uh, did you go to a duty station or did you go directly to the, uh, uh, field, was it field medical? Yeah. So I went to a duty station. Okay. Uh, I wanted to go to field medical, but that was not what they wanted. Uh, uh -huh. they wanted me to go to there, you know, cause they have billets to fill. And, um, I got a, you know, like a few choices, uh, to go. And I went to Cherry Point. Uh, North Carolina, which is the, the wing side of the core. Uh, yeah. but I was there at uh, Cherry Point Naval Hospital and, uh, they put me in labor and delivery. Wow. Yeah. The, the one thing that I went over in school, you know, we went over that and I was like, whatever they do, I don't want to do that. That's where they put me. Um, and you know, there were civilian nurses, you know, they're GSW, whatever, uh, you know, they're Navy employees, you know, or right. government employees. Um, and they pretty much sat at the desk and we started all the IVs, uh, started all the Foley catheters, uh, um, the we did the lion's share of the patient care. Uh, they had us, you know, breaking down rooms, setting up rooms for delivery. Um, it was it was intense. I was I was in on about. I was there a little bit over a year, and I was in on. I counted before I left. I pulled the logs. Cause I wanted to see, I was curious. I was in on about a thousand deliveries. No kidding. Holy. Well, cow. they didn't, they didn't champus people out then, you know, nowadays they, they don't really, I, I, what I've been told, they don't really do a lot of deliveries in the smaller Naval hospitals. And, right. um, man, it was, it, sometimes it'd just be you and a, somebody else back there, another corpsman. And the majority of us were guys. So we're, you know, I just turned 19 and you're back there, you know, <laughs> helping these women deliver babies and, um, Seeing things up, Oh no. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Um, it learned an incredible amount, uh, truthfully. Um, one of the nurses there, uh, or Raina Glue, Mrs. Glue. She's an RN. She's from Boston, man. She was tough. You know, um, that's where I actually learned how to work hard, truthfully. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it was so because we were the only department in the hospital that was given uh, extra money, like your food. You know, you get a food ration amount, a monthly amount. I don't know what it's called, like a food chit or whatever it is mm -hmm. um we got a few hundred bucks a month because we didn't get breaks no lunches no anything so you had to pack oh, your own food only 
only place in the hospital that didn't do that. So um, it was cool, you know, that we got the extra money, but it was not cool because they had you working the whole time. Um, and and how many when you would have a shift, like how long was your shift? So the shifts were eight plus hours, but they were always plus, you know? Yeah. Um, always plus. So they ended up at 10 hours. And, you know, if we were doing nights, you did seven nights in a row. Wow. You know, and then you get four days off and then you'd switch to AMs. And okay. you switch to PMs and then you switch back to nights and then you switch to AMs and you go PMs and you go nights. Um. Wow. And the first, you know, that's actually where I experienced my seeing death. My first death was a woman. Her husband was on deployment. And she had twin boys and they were like 22 weeks gestation and they couldn't stop the contractions or anything like that. And she had the baby both babies and you know i held one and she held one kind of and you know it's this thing's you know fully formed it's got fingernails and little eyelashes oh. and um it was it wasn't it was you know the some of the neo some of the nurses from the neonatal part or the nursery part of the facility came in and they thought I was the dad, you know, cause I was sitting there just kind of like, man, you know, I was, I was feeling it, you know, it was, yeah. the thing was trying, you know, the baby's trying to breathe, you know, mm -hmm. and you're just looking at it and you can't do anything. You just gotta let it struggle and die. And wow. then, and then, you know, we, she, you know, I think had the option of having the, the, the children buried or examined and she wanted them examined, I think because of, of uh, possible future issues of having babies and want to get them, see if there's something going on with that. So you take them and you go put them in these little tubs full of these, full of this formula. And you stack them in this little, wow, little plastic container and label them. You know, it was really weird to put little babies in those things. It was, yeah. Oh, wow. You know, uh, that was, you know, so I, I, I learned how to deal with patients, you know, how to talk to people like that, how to deal with intense situations. Uh, cause it was always intense. You know, you're having a baby. It's a big deal. You know, yeah. it hurts. Um, and back then they didn't give epidurals. Oh, ouch. Well, okay. Uh, Asterix. So, uh, enlisted did not get epidurals. <laughs> that sounds right. <laughs> Ex officer's wives or an officer got epidurals. That's it. Everybody else was just like, you know, <laughs> raw, raw dog in the world, you know. <laughs> you know wow. it tough man uh, um so you know did did that during that time man i put in for every school i tried to get you know to to get to go to field medical service school early i i even put in for jump school um they eventually just told me just stop you're, you're finishing your your duty here you know right uh, so, uh, I, I did my, did my time there and a, a small story related that was, um, you know, when, when we, when the babies were delivered, the nurse would stand at the head of the bed and they would push the Pitocin into the bag, which helps contract the vessels and helps control bleeding after, after the placenta is delivered. Well, the doctors would hand the babies to us. We would get the APGAR scores, the one in five minute scores on how well the baby's doing, give them the oxygen blow by, bag them if need be, all this kind of stuff. 
And, you know, during the delivery process, we're watching the, the women, watching the monitors, because we put these monitors either on, on the outside of them or sometimes internally to monitor the baby's uh, heart rate and those kind of things to see if they're under stress. You know, because if their heart rate's dropping, then uh, this kid's having a tough time and they may need to go for emergency C-section or the mom may need to be put on oxygen or all these things is my wife during our first delivery, our first child, we had a brand new nurse first night on not recognizing late D cells, Whoa. which is a bad sign, meaning the baby's under stress. And I went out and said, Hey, she's having late D cells. I was watching the monitor. She goes, Oh, it's fine. I said, no, it's not. And I went in there, I grabbed the O2, put it on. Um, uh, I had to, you know, my wife's pressure wasn't doing good. I upped the IV fluids. I was all, I was doing it all myself. And uh, when the baby, before she was delivered, they called the doc in. He was livid, not at me, because uh, I told him what was going on. Uh, they didn't have the, the, oh, the part for the baby to go into ready. They, you got to warm it up. You got to get the oxygen blow by ready. You got to get all this stuff ready. Right. None of that was set up. Oh, my God. Got all that set up, too. So I credit the Navy for helping save my daughter's life. Yeah, that's incredible. So wow. that was, you know, or 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 at least not having some, you know, anoxic brain injury or something like that. So, yeah, uh, I definitely use that skill, you know, uh, years later in 1995. You know, so that was, I was, I was very thankful that I got placed in labor and delivery. Yeah. Turned out well for you in the long run. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, exactly. I, I'll, I'll, I, I'd re redo it in a heartbeat, you know? Yeah. And now, now how long total were you uh, with labor and delivery? A little over a year. Okay. And, and then in, you did how many again? Uh, a thousand. <laughs> that is insane. Dude, it was, I, you knew you was going to have a busy day. The only busy day I didn't have that I recall vividly because it was Christmas, my first Christmas away from home, was um, it was we got snow that year in North Carolina. Really weird. There was it was snowy. It was cold, and um, the only baby born that day was a stillborn. No kidding. Yeah, it, you know, we felt horrible because this, you know, you know now that this woman is going to remember this. Yeah. For the it's rest of her life. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, the implications, you know, once you start thinking about the implications of this, you, you know, it starts, you know, mm -hmm. you're, it, it, you start seeing how things affect people, you know, and, it, it, you know, being 19, uh, 20 years old, you know, you start going, wow, you know, this, it, it's, it starts really putting it in your mind, how, how real things are, you know, and mm -hmm. how everything you do matters, you know, and, you know, trying to do your best, trying to be on your A game all the time, you know, not that we can stop that, but it, it, um, it was a very weird first, uh, Christmas away from home experience, I must say, you know, oh, yeah. so. I can see uh, that. Yeah. What a, now I, I got a question for you. Uh, Cause you were dealing with, you know, a lot of trauma of death and, and those types of things. Now, did you do, uh, did they help you as far as like sit you down and, and help cope with those types of things? Was that happening then? No, no, there was no debriefs. Yeah. You know, um, even now I work in medicine um, mm -hmm. and um I'm um, I'm a PA, and I work in exclusively in rural, remote emergency rooms. I'm the only provider on, um, and sometimes we're the only hospital in the county. And um, so, and I cover the patients on the floor as well. Oh you know, wow! Do the do the admissions, uh, do the rounding, 
do the discharges. There's a code, there's a code, you know, the heart attack strokes, you, you know, you name it. Uh, wow. That that's what we do. So it's a little different now. You, you know, you try to, and you want to debrief people and you want to do that, but sometimes things are busy and you just don't have time. That's in the ideal world. We would debrief people, but mm -hmm. somebody else is over there needing your help. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? You gotta, you gotta go. So they try to do that kind of stuff, but it just, truthfully, it never really happens. I've, had a few really bad, bad ones uh, happen in the ERs that, that I've worked at. And you know, I've had a few get to me, you know, um, just because it was a kid or uh, somebody that I knew. I took care of somebody that I knew that died uh, in one of my emergency rooms. And it, it, it bothered me for, well, it still bothers me right now. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's so no, they didn't, they didn't say nothing to you back then. Yeah. It, it was. So it's just kind of, you, you had to figure out how to cope with it on your own uh, or maybe with your buddies or whatever. If you're talking about stuff, you know, pretty, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. It was just, you know, just it's expected uh, career choice. Right. Stuff. You signed up for this. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, not to say that we shouldn't have that, but it just doesn't happen. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, it does get busy, you know, that's for sure. Right. I don't think you've ever gone to an emergency room or, or something like that, and it wasn't busy. It's always busy every time I've ever gone in one. Right. And that's a word you never say in the emergency room either, is you don't use the B word. Oh, if yeah. It's nice and chill. Somebody says, it's not very busy in here. What did you just say? <laughs> excuse me now you're going to have to help if whatever comes in you just curse us all you know yeah um, yeah that makes sense <laughs> yeah you, you, you don't you don't tempt fate like that uh, <laughs> you know uh, it's just not something you do yeah all right so you did uh, uh your time uh there labor and delivery and then yep. where did you go from there what happened next uh, I finally got to go to field medical service school. Uh, I don't know if they still call it that. Uh, Please. it's at, at Camp Johnson, which is part of Camp Lejeune. Mm -hmm. It was in the summer. It was in, I think we started in August and, um, you know, there's swamps down there, you know, it's wet and, um, you know, I already been in for a little while and, you know, they put us in these open style barracks and it's ran by uh, Navy corpsmen and Marines. So it's a oh, wow. dual. So they're like drill instructors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sleeping in a rack and they come in and they throw the empty trash can down the, <laughs> down the middle. Get up, get up, wake up, you know, and I, I wake up and I'm like looking at this guy like, what in the world? He's like, get your eyeballs off me. And I'm like, okay, this is it. This is all right. Now, now I'm here, you know, um, <laughs> it, it, it was, now that was physically demanding. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was a physically demanding thing. Um, you know, got indoctrinated into the, um, Marine Corps mindset. Uh, most definitely, um, Cause it's all voluntary, you know, you don't have to go to the, this, this thing. So you're choosing to go green side. Um, and, um, it, you know, the humps, you know, going on those long humps, you know, full packs, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, also getting good grades was a really big deal, uh, be along with being physically fit. And I had trained myself to an insane level before I got there. Cause I knew it was coming up. So I, I was doing good as far as, you know, pull up. So I was maxing everything more than, and, right. um, it, the, the mental part of that, you know, the, the, the test taking, whatever platoon did the worst had to carry an anchor during humps. 
Oh no. <laughs> like this little, like a metal anchor. It was heavy. So he, with a rope. <laughs> so, so you didn't want to be the anchor platoon, you know, cause it, you know, it pays to be a winner. Yeah. You know, type, type, uh, type stuff. Um, and it, it, it was intense. I, it got me up to speed, you know, uh, on, you know, what it's like to, what they expect out of you, you know, um, not only mentally, but physically, uh, you know, you know, we're doing the Marine Corps PFTs, you know, um, and then if you, if you do 20 pull-ups and they see that you didn't struggle, now go do some dips. You, you did that too easy. Go do some dips, you know, go get on dip bar, pump, pump out a few, you know, very nice. Uh, you know, and you, you happily do that, you know, cause you're, you know, you're, you're young, you know, you're bucking up, you know, so, yeah. um, you don't get to choose which unit you go with. You know, I just, I wanted to go wherever they wanted to send me. And, um, I got, uh, sent to uh, 3rd Battalion, uh, 10th Marines mm. there in Camp Lejeune, uh, yeah. artillery. Uh, the unit I was actually with was 312, who was an attached unit who was out of Okinawa, but they had never unattached them from Vietnam. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so it really weird. So we were 312, but we were actually 310. Um. So I don't know why they did that. We just were, uh, you know, kind of the the bastard children of uh, 310 a little bit, yeah. you know. Um, and they relished in that, you know. Yeah, they liked sure. being a little bit different. You know, everybody likes to be a thorn, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Go go across the grain a little bit. Everybody likes to go across the grain a little bit. It, you know, it it's a matter of pride to be, you know, uh, be given little... less and expected to do more. You know, everybody yeah, you know yeah. feels that way. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it 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 was it was a good introduction, and I, I got lucky, and I got with a, a a great group of guys. Truthfully, I I I always felt like I was where I was supposed to be every time. Nice. You know, so I always felt that way and I, I feel fortunate. Yeah, definitely. Now, and uh, at that point, kind of walk through what was your uh, kind of your daily schedule with those guys? Like what, what was your job? What did all the that? <sighs> so, you know, regular, you know, I was single living in the barracks. Um, you know, I, you know, I had, um, well, my, my roommates were Marines, you know, um, wake up five 30, you know, go to formation, you know, if you need to pick up cigarette butts, you need to pick up cigarette butts, you know, make police the yard and, um, get, get the general information of the day. And then everybody disseminates to their own area. And mine was battalion aid station. And, uh, you know, they had you doing whatever work that happens in a battalion aid station. You know, one day you might be filling prescriptions or doing sick call or messing with charts or whatever. But we did a lot of in the field training. Uh, I think because during that time, uh, the Gulf War was, it was already stirred up mm -hmm. it had stirred up during my field medical service school they made an announcement during our school about that and right. so they kind of turned the heat up a little bit because of that in field medical service school they kind of ramped up our the attitude and the discipline and the hazing and the, all that you know they because of the pending situation uh right so when I got to our unit, uh, pretty much just within a few weeks, maybe a couple, I was out in the field. 
And, yeah. um, and for guys that, you know, for the, your first time out in the field, uh, you get jumped, you know, you did, yeah. you know, um, and I knew it was coming. I was told that, uh, I was going to get jumped. And, uh, there was two of us that was new to the unit. It was me and a Marine. And, um, uh, I knew it was coming. And so I started telling Marine jokes, derogatory Marine jokes <laughs> <laughs> to egg it on. Cause I mean, I'm going to get it over with, you know, cause you don't know when it's coming. Yeah. I didn't want to be surprised. So, uh, I'll tell you the joke I told one of them. All right. Yeah. Uh, this is the other one I can't say because I'm still a professional. I'll tell it to you when we're either off camera <laughs> <laughs> or I'm retired from my medical <laughs> career. Um, but the, one of the jokes was, um, there was four army rangers. They're rowing in a river singing be all that you can be in the army and God's watching them. And uh, he decides to just play a little trick on him and mess with him. So he takes 25% of the brain power away and they're singing, be all that, be all that 50% gone. Be all, be all 75%. Be, be a hundred percent from the halls of Montez, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one i like yeah. that <laughs> nobody appreciated it <laughs> <laughs> i did <laughs> i thought it was hilarious and uh that's when they decided to jump me and um as long as you fight back you know you're good you know what i mean you know you you, know, you get a little some few tussles if you guys jump on you and you start getting a little dangerous and they they back off and you're 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 accepted. Well, the other guy, um, he was really smart, but was not a very physical person. Right. I would say he barely passed the PFT kind of a guy, you know, um, and he wouldn't fight back. And they ended up, uh, taking his pants down and I don't know if you've seen that, you know, the, the things that hold up the nets, those big, long fiberglass things that they, they're like butterflies. They call them butter. I think they call them that. They're like three things and they're golly, man. They're like several feet long. Yeah. They're very thin. And so they took those and whooped his butt red and he cried. Oh no. Oh, Exactly. So that set his whole trajectory. And I'll 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 get back to him later because that was it was like, oh man, that that poor guy. You know, what I mean, he's he I was always nice to him, you know, because I was a corpsman, you know, you gotta be cool there, buddy, you know. Yeah, but man, he just you know, he was a bug, you know. We called him a bug, you know, guys that don't fit in, you're a bug. You know, because you're a bug in the system. And he was definitely a bug. So he, um, it was, it was not. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then just a few weeks after that, we got sent out for, I guess, yearly qualifications. Uh, they have to go out and perform these, um, oh, these fire missions. Uh, to certain standards, uh, timing, you know, how fast can you, you know, it's called CSMO, how fast can you collect your crap and move out? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, uh, you know, all these different things, setting up, you know, watches, and it's just every aspect of a functioning artillery unit it was happening. And, you know, I'm sleeping in the back of a five-ton truck one night, and I get a tap on my shoulder. They're like, Doc, get up. I'm like, what? what's going on? Somebody hurt? No, man, we need you, though. I'm like, what's going on? Don't worry. We'll tell you. So, <clears throat> exactly. So, uh, I'm not going to say his name because it's about turned into a big event. 
So uh, he was a really cool guy. He was a sergeant. He was uh, just 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 a stud. Um, and he had a few other guys with him. And he said, like, "Get all your stuff. We need it." He goes and, and grab and grab your M sixteen because at that time we all had M sixteens out there with blanks. And uh, I didn't have my pistol at that point in time, you know, because I don't have pistol blanks. So, because uh, we usually as corpsmen carry uh, bread and nine mills at that time. And uh, so I grabbed my M16 and my rounds and we go out and we're going out. I was like, what are we doing? He said, well, we're going to raid headquarters. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean raid headquarters? He said, we're going to go raid headquarters. We're going to go stir up some stuff. So... We sneak all the way to headquarters. This is on Camp Johnson, a, yeah. a uh, army base that we're on. Uh, or, uh, yeah, it's Camp Johnson, I think. No, it Camp was Johnson. It Johnson. No, it was it was in North Carolina. It was a um, uh, fort. Um, it's not it's not camp because it, it's that's Marine. It was oh. Fort something in North Carolina. Uh-huh. Uh, and so that's where we're doing the big, our big training at. It was off, off base at, right. the, at, at this fort. Um, and we end up sneaking through the guys through all the centuries. Uh, and he throws a smoke grenade into the battalion commander's tent. Oh, no. He about burnt the whole thing down. So we go booking out of there. Guys are chasing us. We're shooting blanks at them, running. Guys are running at us. There's a couple of guys hit trees of their guys hit trees running after us. We come back, you know, we stand in the middle of wherever, fire guns up in there, bah, 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 you know, three round burst and uh, <laughs> take off. And um, nobody gave up who did it. But uh, they admired our moxie, but did not appreciate the actions. You know, it was kind of, it was just silly, you know, just fun, silly stuff that if we'd have gotten caught, we'd have been in so much trouble, you know. So uh, I was glad they entrusted me enough to, 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 I'd only been there like a month and they're like, yeah, man, you, you're not going to rat nobody. I was like, awesome. I'm in, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, so that, that was kind of cool. Wow. Um, and then golly, not even just a few months later, um, we were deployed, uh, to Kuwait in, uh, December. Okay. Um, and, uh, got there at base camp 15 and, you know, got briefed on what was kind of going on and, uh, Christmas morning, we, uh, had to dig a whole bunch of fighting holes called Saddam Hussein said he's going to deliver us scud missiles for Christmas. And, um, so we got all that ready. And, uh, right after that, we went out to the field just a few days later. And, uh, that's when all that kind of kicked off. Wow. So, uh, so you were there, uh, for the whole thing at that point. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. So kind of talk us through a little bit of your experiences there uh, while you were there at, in Kuwait into uh, Iraq. Did you know you just pushed them back to Iraq? Yeah, right? we yeah we went all the way to Kuwait City. Got it. Okay. Yeah, we went all the way to Kuwait City. Now, we were very upset that uh, we did not get to continue. You know, uh, we were not happy that things ended so quickly. Uh, yeah. It was not something that we thought we should do. We, you know, they said that we, you know, you know, at the end of it, you know, you completed your objective. And we're all like, all these objectives are just made up. Have another objective. You know what I mean? Let's go get this guy. Yeah. You know, we're here, yeah. you know, um, so that's a that was the whole thing. So, um, man, there were so many logistical nightmares. Uh, 
we we ran out of MREs. Uh, we only we got down to where they made us only eat two a day. Nice. And um, not that I mean one MRE has plenty of calories. You just don't have the volume of food to make you feel full. But you know, so um, they, you know, this is why we're just kind of living out in the desert, moving around. Uh, it was awesome to sleep at night because it was cold. Um, and, you know, you could see stars from each horizon, you know, on 360, you know, all the way. It was like, I mean, it is it beautiful, beautiful at night. Yeah. Uh, it was really cool. Um, until the, you know, the, uh, the smoke from all the oil fires, because, you know, he blew up a ton of, uh, of, uh, the oil wells. Yeah. The oil wells. And, uh, they were, it, that was a whole nother thing. You know, you're living in soot basically, but, um, uh, you know, we, we had ran out of MREs, uh, not ran out, but we were on limited supply and they tried to make it up to us by bringing a, um, a hot meal to us. And okay. so they trucked this hot meal to us, but it took like 20 hours mm -hmm. to get to us. By the time it was done, it was spoiled because it had been kept hot. Everybody got a belly ache from it. We were all so pissed off, man. Um, you know, so had a couple of my buddies, they distracted them. I, I jumped on there and I stole all kinds of bread and all kinds of stuff off their supply truck. You know, I ate so much bread that night. I, I, the next night I got a belly ache, you know, yeah. I didn't know I could get belly ache off of bread, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> we stole as much food, you know, I'm up there just you know, chunking out, you know, stuff while they're doing the old, Hey, so what are you guys doing? You know, all, you know, small yeah. talking them. You know, while we do a heist of food, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it was uh, it, that eventually they, they got all that squared away. You know, eventually yeah. got they got us some memories and, and all that good stuff. Um, that's about the time when they had us take. Um, they were. Suppose they were called nap pills, I believe is what they were called. They were for, um, to help with, uh, nerve gas poisoning. Okay. I, I don't know what the health implications of those things were, but I didn't take them. I, I don't know if they still know what <laughs> they don't. They don't. Um, I didn't take them. A few of the guys take them. They were having horrible nightmares. They were having all kinds of weird side effects. Um, they handed them to me to hand out. And I'm having to tell my my guys, you know, to take these. And I'm shaking my head no while I'm talking. Yeah. You know, because I just had a really bad feeling about this, you know, experimental drugs to help me. Our gas mask had internal filters. They were not the external filter kind. And they told us that if we got to a hot zone of nerve agent, that uh, we would never be able to get outside of it. There are, they would have become saturated and that basically it would have been useless anyway. Wow. So. Kidding. Yeah. So they told us that, you know, so that's kind of not comforting. Um, kidding. <laughs> lie to me, you know, yeah. the government lies enough. Lie to me, you know, that's right. uh, make me feel good. Make me feel fuzzy about this, you know. Um, and they, <laughs> so it, it would be, it, it wouldn't have mattered anyway. You know, we carried the atropine and two pan chloride, you know, on us for, if we did get hit, um, and uh, our nerve 
agent did actually, uh, detectors did go off one night. Really? Yeah. Was there anything there or was it just? Well, they said it didn't. They said it was false. Uh, my lieutenant, Lieutenant uh, John Tanagi, uh, who I spoke to yesterday, uh, because I want to get my story straight. Um, and, um, he told he's, he had his, you know, we're from full mop gear and he tells us, uh, this is during the ground where he tells us, um, that's false positive. You can go ahead and take your mask off. And I said, take yours off first. You know, <laughs> he looked at me, he took them off. I was like, he's like, go ahead. I'm like, I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting to see what happens. You're the canary, you know? Um, you know, like you can't kill me. There's only one of me, you know? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, he didn't die or act, get any twitches or, you know, start act like he had nerve agent, uh, poisoning. So supposedly not, but you know, I think even battalion said theirs went off too. So. Wow. Well, there had to have been something. I something. Mean, they don't off yeah. or nothing. Yeah, well, damn. That was my point. You know what I mean? I was like, yeah. I don't, what do you believe? You know what I mean? Is it worth breathing in the air? Is it worth a test? I don't, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah. I mean, they had us wearing those mop suits for days. Those things are only good for like, I don't know, a little bit. You know what I mean? That's true. Yeah. You know, we wore them for days, you know, yeah. just yeah. so, and they got charcoal in them. Mm -hmm. so everybody's got this charcoal dust all over them. We look like, you know, hobos. Uh, <laughs> Cause you know, you got this, this dark grimy stuff all over you, you know? Um, so I, it, it was all for naught, you know, if it would really happen, it wouldn't have mattered. Oh Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think it was, it's there just for your your mental uh, stability to say that there's some sort of protective barrier. Uh, right. Yeah, it, it, it was there to make you feel good. I, that's kind of how I, you know, it's not like we could have got another set, you know. <laughs> True. You know, it's not like you could have asked for another set. So it we're, was, we were lucky enough that they had enough for everybody that time. Now, <laughs> it could have. Truthfully, yes. I mean, um, the Marine Corps is known for not um, giving you all the stuff you need. Right. You, you know what I mean? Uh, or at least it's the old version, you know, yeah. or whatever, you know, and yeah. Marines old take version. pride in that. You know, we, you know, they take pride in the having less and doing more attitude, True. you know. Uh, so, uh Man, you know, we didn't, during, before all the, you know, uh, any of us actually doing any firing, the amount of air power that came over us 24-7 was just astronomical. Huh. It was, the ground would shake. You know, it was just constant bombing. I mean, they put it on them. I mean, air air was key. Yeah. You know, um, you know, General Schwarzkopf was in charge during that time, and uh, he had seen the mistakes of Vietnam, and all those guys were very. Um, keen on what we need, what we need to do to win. Right. Uh, and limit uh, American lives. And they did it. They did it in spades, man. You know, huh. I, I, um, I just, the, the air power is just, it was awesome. It was I don't even know how to describe just how overwhelming that was. You know, I, I, I don't know what could have stood after that. 
Yeah. And you wonder like, well, I guess they didn't really fight too much, uh, you know, but uh, they ran from it. I'm sure, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. If you could, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, you know, they were really good about taking out uh, key uh, targets, you know, uh, radars, um, lots of ground vehicles and stuff like that. And uh, they did a, they did an excellent job of setting the, setting the stage for us to go in. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. they did a really good job. Um, around, it was on February 12th, we did a raid. This was two weeks before the ground war started. We went and did a firing raid. And um, on our way there, um, again, logistics and things were kind of spotty. We had a, uh, a GPS in our Humvee and so and we were had the only one so we were the lead Humvee we were the ones that um led the led the formation but it wasn't satellite based it was antenna based okay yeah it's it, it was called a PLARS P L A R S PLARS unit and uh we were always outpacing the antennas so it was old school compass um, time. And uh, on the way to the raid, we did not realize that we were skirting the pause. You know, a pause is a place where in the Marines is where, you know, you stay, you know, as a right. unit. So we ran on to the pause of, I think it was two eight. I think okay. it was. And we're the lead vehicle. And we I'm I'm back there kind of sleeping, you know, kind of nodding off because it's dark. Luckily I had my helmet on. We hit a, a hole and the entire passenger side of the Humvee goes into this hole. Boom. My head hits the seat in front of me, which was where the lieutenant was sitting because he was navigating, bam. And then I get thrown out of the vehicle and all the stuff from in the vehicle lands on me and this Humvee is now like this, you know, you know, down in the back tire is above head height. Wow. So I'm out, I'm laid out and, um, all the stuff's on top of me, but the way it looks, it looks like my legs are trapped. So my driver, Joe Dove, um, he's like, oh my God, we killed Doc. Um, and he's like, Doc, Doc, Doc. And I'm, you all right? He's like, no, man, I just got the ass knocked out of me. Um, <laughs> and uh, we got a bunch of Marines from our unit. They grabbed it, pulled, you know, hung off the Humvee until they could ride it, got enough weight. And pulled out of there, and that was the fighting hole. The next hole over, we're just talking a, just a couple of feet, was where they were sleeping inside another hole. Wow. So it was two holes right next to each other. They had their fighting hole and their sleeping hole. And we were just a matter of a couple of feet from killing those two Marines wow. that were in that sleeping hole. That is insane. Yeah, so we got lucky. Uh, we cruised on, uh, went to the raid, and uh, Lieutenant Tanagi uh, told me yesterday he's not, he wasn't he's not a lieutenant now. He's retired out. He's a he's a instructor now. Uh, government. He's a government. You know, GS W thirteen or something like that. Teaching uh, Intel. Um, he. Uh, he told me that the reason why we went on that raid was to bait the Iraqis to fire up their anti-artillery uh, radar so we could, so the air could bomb them. Ah, okay. Yeah. So we, we thought we were like, you know, going to hit some important targets. We were just, you know, bait. Um, I'm sure we blew up something cool, you know, uh, yeah. you know, something, I think we blew up a bridge or something uh, and some other stuff. 
And uh, we did get some, you know, incoming rounds, a few incoming rounds coming, but they were way off because the air had really, like I said, messed their, their radars and all that stuff up. Mm-hmm. And um, one of our guns got stuck. Uh, we were using the M1 nine or eights. I think they shoot a, I think it's 155 millimeter round. I think, I think um, somebody will correct me. I'm sure. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know anything about the artillery. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, my memory gets a little fuzzy on all the nomenclature, uh, but they're M1 nine or eights and they, you know, these big guns are pulled by five tons and, you know, when you have that, you know, the artillery gun, you you spread the trails and set them in and they jack it up on this disc, this big disc, so they can pivot it when they lay the battery, you know, when they triangulate it, get it, everybody zeroed in on, so their fire direction center can tell you where to shoot. Well, in the, that part of the sand in that area, because each, each artillery piece is, about a hundred meters apart. Okay. Uh, because incoming rounds with artillery, mm-hmm. uh, if we get counter shot at by them, it's about a 50 square meter kill radius and a hundred square meter casualty radius per round. Wow. So you don't bunch all your guns together for that reason. Mm-hmm. So we have eight guns spread out over, you know, six to 800 meters, you know, and I covered four of them. Um, and so that disc had gotten down to the sand and was stuck. So I booked down there and, um, you know, we're, I'm helping dig them out cause I'm not doing anything. Nobody's hurt, you mm-hmm. know, so I'm digging them out and we're getting rounds in and I'm like, man, you know, uh, I, I'm glad they're bad shots, <laughs> you know? Uh, <laughs> so we got them out of there. That was, that was, it was fun you know, to do, you know, everybody's you know, your first fire mission. Everybody's just pumped, you know, yeah. jacked up on adrenaline. It was, it was, it was, it was kind of awesome. Um, and it wasn't for another two weeks that then, then the ground war actually started. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Well, Hey, um, I think that's a good place uh, to kind of pause this show awesome. and then we'll do, we'll do the part two. Uh, okay. but, uh, yeah, thanks for coming on and, and sharing this part. Uh, part two is going to be even better, I'm sure. Uh, but, uh, thank you very much, uh, to yeah, all man. the listeners out there. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Remember if you ever need any help and, and you're struggling and you, you want to hurt yourself or anybody else, uh, don't hesitate to reach out for help. The VA has a wonderful thing. Uh, you can always dial 988 press option one. You'll be able to talk to somebody. They'll be able to point you in contact with somebody that can help you. If you don't want to call and you'd rather text, you can text 838-255. Again, that's 838-255. The same deal. They'll, they'll be able to get, uh, get you in point, get you in contact with somebody that can help you. And you can always go to the website, uh, veteranscrisisline.net. And they also have a chat icon that you can do as well. Uh, but one veteran's life lost is one too many. I care about you. I know Brandon cares about you and everybody else. All the other veterans care about you as well. Uh, with that, thanks for tuning in. Uh, be sure to tune in for part two. Stay motivated. Change your socks.